So Christmas is upon us, and uh, Christmas is a time, obviously, where there's a whole lot of giving. And uh, this week, uh, I was thinking about the fact that how people sort of uh, do giving differently. They, they take it different and various approaches to giving. And I was like thinking about that, and I was like, oh, I want to analyze that a little bit and do some research. And so I did. And, and by research, I mean, I spent about three to five minutes thinking about it. And what I did is I kind of like mapped out some, some different approaches to giving that people take. And I'm just going to walk through these very briefly. And, and if one of these describes you or describes someone that's with you, don't start looking around at people that could get like really, really uncomfortable Actually do, that could be a lot of fun. So I'm going to talk through a couple of these, and the first type of giver is, I'm passing on to you a gift I received and didn't like, gift giver. You, you, yeah, you know, you know who I'm talking about. You know anyone like that? I do. I'm... I'm married to her and I love her, but uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you like got like you know a, a Christmas, uh, you know, a Christmas sweater last year for Christmas. Someone gave that to you, and it was supposed to be a nice one, but it was like it was so ugly. It could have won every single ugly Christmas sweater contest like ever and ever, and you forgot to take it back. And even if you would have taken it back, they wouldn't have taken it back, even if you had a receipt because it's so ugly. They didn't want it back, and then you start thinking you're like, man, but I haven't got my mother-in-law a present yet this year. And she likes Christmas, and she likes being warm, and so you give it to her. Like maybe, maybe one year you got, you know, a fruit cake. I mean, that always seems to keep showing up at Christmas. And you get the fruit cake in the tin, and, and you like, you know, stuff it in the back of the pantry because that's where it belongs. And you forgot all about it. And, and then this year came, and you're like, yeah, fruit cake can't go bad. It's already bad. And so I'll just give that as a gift. Like, like have you ever given a gift like that? If, you've been, if you received a gift like that, you know what to do with it, right? Give it away. It's the gift that just keeps on giving. So give it to someone else. Another one, this is just so common, is, is I got a great deal on this gift giver. And you've experienced this. You like, like open up the gift, and, and you're not sure really how to react because it's, it's not something you wanted, and it's not even something you needed, and you can't even figure out what it is. And so you're like, oh, oh you know, and you're just like keep looking at it. And, and finally you get the courage to, to look the person in the eye who bought it for you, and they're just smiling at you. <laughs> and they're smiling at you with a smile that says, I hope they don't know I only bought this because it was a really good deal. We know. We know, okay? And so some of you just need to accept the fact that even though it was the best deal you've ever seen ever, it's still a really bad gift. And so this year, and you're in the store, and there's a sign that says five for 25, but you don't know what it is. Just keep walking, just keep walking. We do not want that present, okay? One more, and it's this one. This is all that was left, gift giver. And this is not a time of confession. Because we already know who you are. Because on Christmas Eve, when everyone else is relaxing around the movie and maybe around the fire, you always just end up disappearing and going down to Walgreens and seeing what they have left. We know. If you're one of these types of gift givers, you need to repent and stop in your ways, okay? There's still two weeks before Christmas. There's still time to give a thoughtful gift. So we are in this series for a few weeks called Three Gifts. And we're spending some time taking a close look at the gifts that these men called the Magi brought to baby Jesus very shortly after he was born. And, and the Bible tells us that, that they brought him gold and frankincense and, and myrrh, and myrrh. Uh, pretty like obscure gifts to, to bring to a little baby, but, but, but they didn't bring those gifts because they got like a good deal at the flea market or because it was the only thing left. They brought these gifts very, very intentionally and inspired by God because they communicated so much about who Jesus was and is and why he he came. And so last week, we, we talked very briefly about the idea that they brought him gold. And, and gold was obviously a very valuable gift, monetarily speaking, but, but we believe that's not why they probably brought that gift to Jesus. They brought gold to Jesus because of its rich symbolism, because gold is a gift that you would give to a king. Kings loved gold because it communicated power and, and stability and significance and longevity. It was, it was the number one gift you would bring to a king. And when they brought gold to Jesus, they were absolutely shouting from the mountaintops that, that we have a king right here. And, and not only was he a king, we, we know this now, that, that he was the king. Like he was the, the king of kings and he was the, the lord of all lords. And, and still, not only is the king of all creation, but he absolutely wants to be the king of your life and mine. And he is a good, good king. 
Unlike any other king, he, he, he wants to do good for you. He wants to do good in you. He doesn't want to take anything from you. He wants to give good, good life to you. He can protect you and provide for you and, and love you more so than anyone else ever could. And he wants to do that. And for those of you that, you know, you have Jesus as king of your life and he's leading your life, let him keep doing what he does. He is really, really good at it, and he has so much in store for you. And, and there's others of you that, that you haven't yet submitted to Jesus as the king and the leader and the Lord of your life or whatever. Like, um, don't, don't wait too long. Because submitting to Jesus, it, it, is, it is not an obligation. It is the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, Jesus, yes, he wants to have the control in your life. He wants to have the authority in your life. But it is not a threat. It is a very, very generous offer. I encourage you to take him up on it soon, as Rose has today. And so we talked about gold, and, and then today we're going to talk about that next gift they brought him, and, and it was that big word, it was, it was frankincense. And I, I think that we can safely say that most of us don't have a great deal of familiarity with frankincense. Like, I'm pretty sure when you as adults wrote your Christmas wish list this year, you didn't include frankincense. And if you did, you probably had been drinking too much spiked eggnog. You need to stop that, okay? But you probably did not put this on your list. Most of us don't know anything about frankincense. For, for so many years, I'd be in church, and I'd hear like the Christmas story or like the Christmas pageant, and they're like, they brought Jesus gold and myrrh and frankincense. And I'm like, franken what? Like, what the heck is that? And my mom and dad were like, just, just trust it, okay? We, we, don't, we don't know either. But frankincense, it's, it's what it sounds like. It's, it's incense. It was made from tree sap resin. It was made from a Boswellia tree, and I've just always known these things, okay? No, I looked it up, all right? It came from a Boswellia tree, and so frankincense was, like, uh, really valuable because it didn't grow. Boswellia trees didn't grow in Palestine. They had to trade for it, but frankincense, it, it was used in almost every single religious ceremony. It was kind of like the, the go-to scent that priests really love to use. So when these magi, these men from the east, came and, and gave frankincense to Jesus, they were also announcing, we've got a priest here. And not just a priest, but the ultimate priest. Now, honestly, most of us don't necessarily tend to think about Jesus as a priest. Like, even if you were like me and you grew up in church, you may still never have heard that. I spent exactly my entire life in church, and not one time did I ever hear Jesus being talked about as a, a priest. And, and maybe that's how you've been. You, you like hear Jesus and priests. Like, I don't, I don't know if those two things go together. I've never heard that before. And some of you grew up in, in the Catholic faith. Some of you are Catholic now. And, and you're like, okay, I'm familiar with the priest. I'm familiar with Jesus and what a priest does and who they are. But men have never had that associated with Jesus. But, but the Bible talks about Jesus as a priest a lot. And so we're going to spend just a few minutes talking about Jesus as a priest. Now, now the role of priest has always been very significant amongst God's people. And, and the very first time we really see the idea of a priest, you may be surprised how early it is. It's, it's the very beginning of the Bible. We had Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, and they had two sons, Cain and Abel. And we have this big, big story where Abel, he brought this sacrifice that was considered pleasing to God. And, and Cain did not do that. But what Abel was doing when he made this sacrifice to God is, is he was carrying out his priestly responsibilities. It was really the father of the home that was considered to be the priest. And so they would set the spiritual tone for the family. They would carry out the religious responsibilities of the family. But that was kind of the idea of what the priest was. And then you fast forward to Moses. Maybe you heard of Moses. And when Moses came, the whole idea of priest and priesthood, it, it really advanced. It got more organized. And so it was Moses' brother named Aaron that was called the high priest. And then he appointed what they called vocational priests to work under him and, and work with him. And, and they began doing what fathers had done. They set the spiritual tone for the people, and they carried out the religious responsibilities. And so we have these priests that are beginning to, to develop. And, and, and all this priestly activity, it would happen in and around this area we called the tabernacle. We talked about it very recently. The tabernacle was this like mobile tent that the Israelite were traveling people. And, and so that was the place they did the religious activities. Later on, there was the, the temple when that was a more a stable, secure, permanent facility. And that's where uh, God's presence dwelled. But, but first they had the tabernacle. And that's where all the religious activities took place. And, and so these priests, uh, Aaron and the other priests, they, they had all these religious responsibilities, but the, the primary responsibility they had, religiously speaking, it was this big, big thing called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, what this was, it was one day on the calendar every single year, and it was like the Day of Forgiveness for all the Israelites, every single year. I mean, they marked their calendars for it. 
They knew it was coming. It was a big, big deal because they're like, man, they're, they're sending the camp. They're sending me. They're sending our family, and, and that's going to be the day of forgiveness. And it, it was the day that, that they would, be, in a sense, uh, be set straight. They would get a clean slate in their minds, at least, and, and God reset them and got their attention again. And, and on the day of atonement, all the people would gather around the tabernacle. Like, they got up that morning. It was like, we got to get to the tabernacle. We got to be outside the tent because God's going to do something on this day. And so the, the priest, what they would do is everyone's gathered up. They're like, all right, you guys ready and and they would take a goat and this gets a little gory but they would take a goat and they would sacrifice the goat and and they would they would do that to cleanse the temple to cleanse the tabernacle and to cleanse the sins of the priests themselves then the high priest Aaron he would get two goats and he would take one of the goats into that very special place inside the tabernacle called we talked about it recently the holy of holies you're like well that place sounds like a big deal it was. It, it was the area of the tabernacle that the very presence of God dwelled. And so Aaron, the high priest, he would take one of the goats inside the Holy of Holies, and, and there was this really big deal, this really big moment. And inside the Holy of Holies, he would, he would slaughter one of the goats, and, and he, would, he would take this blood, he would smear it all over his own body, and it was representative, the Bible tells us, of paying the penalty for the sins of all the people. And then he was done with that. He would come out, and, and there's, there's the other goat. And it's like, man, I'm glad I won the goat that was in there. I'm glad I'm the goat that's still out here. And, and if goats could talk, I'm sure that's what they were saying. And he would come, and he would, he would gently put his hands on the goat. And he would confess the sins of all the people in the camp. And with his hands on the goat, it was like we're putting the sins on this goat. And then they would just let that, that goat like wander off into the wilderness as they would watch. And, and that's where we get the idea, by the way, of a scapegoat. It's like all the sins are on this goat, and this goat's going to go off and disappear. And every single year, they celebrated this idea of the Day of Atonement, and it reminded them of the ongoing reality of sin, the costly reality of sin, and God's desire and willingness to do something about sin. Now, God designed and instituted this whole system. It was God that in the design studio of heaven, he drew up the blueprints for the Day of Atonement. And yet, interestingly, there was a sense of, futility in all of it because sin wasn't being dealt with what priests were actually doing every single year when they went through all the the, the religious responsibilities they had they, they were they were putting a band-aid a band-aid on sin is what they were doing now i'm a father we have four little children and i wish when my children were born that i would have invested in band-aid because that would have been a really really great investment for our family financially i'd be retired somewhere you wouldn't even know me and we're like well, that'd be good no but i band-aid like it's a big deal we use a lot of those as a family in fact in case you're noticing yes i have a band-aid on my finger right now it's like timely it's first band-aid i've worn in like 30 years yesterday i shut my own finger in the door and you're like how do you do that you have to have a lot of talent, but I did that, okay? But with Band-Aids, like my kids are like, they need a Band-Aid for everything. If they, if they sca scab their knee, they, they need a Band-Aid. If they, you know, break their arm, they want a Band-Aid. If they get their feelings hurt, they want to wear a Band-Aid because my kids think that Band-Aids fix everything. My daughter's about to find out because she's in here. Band-Aids actually don't fix everything. Band-Aids don't really fix anything. Sorry, Hazel. What they do is they, they cover it up and they give time and space for it to heal, but the Band-Aids don't actually do anything and that's that's imagery of the priests and the sacrificial system that was going on all the sacrifices they performed every single year and all the religious routine they went through every single year it wasn't dealing with sin it was putting a band-aid on sin and pushing it forward to another time that it could be dealt with in another place by another person there was a futility in it and god designed it that way maybe you noticed a minute ago when when i said that you know the priest would make a sacrifice for the sins of all the people what they did first is they made a sacrifice for their own sin but you're like but they were priests but they were man of god yeah, they, they were faithful men. They were, they were good men, I'm sure. They, they were faithful men, but they were flawed men. They, they were sinful men. I, I'm telling you, these priests, and this may disappoint you, I'm telling you, those priests, they struggled with lust. And sometimes greed would dictate their decisions. That they lied to, to gain. They thought too highly of themselves. They were, they were very sinful men, very sinful people because they were people and people are sinful. And, and, and you may think, well, if they couldn't deal with their own sin once for all, how could they ever deal with the sin of other people once for all? They couldn't, and God knew that ahead of time. Listen to what the Bible says in the New Testament, this incredible writing called Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1. It says, and it's a lot, but we'll talk through it. It says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? 
For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepare for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. God put the sacrificial system in place. But he knew ahead of time there was a futility in it. He knew ahead of time that he was just putting a Band-Aid on this very real sin issue. Here's how wise and good God was doing. He was giving us an imagery. He was giving them an example every single year of here's what needs to happen. Blood needs to cover these sins. Blood needs to cover these sins. Blood needs to cover these sins, but the blood of these goats and bulls ain't gonna do it. And so what he was doing, he was, he was pointing their eyes and he was pointing their hearts forward to another time when another priest would come and he would make the final sacrifice, a once and for all sacrifice that would finally allow there to be victory over and healing from sin and there was only one priest that could do it and he resided in heaven and so he came to earth jesus is absolutely king don't be mistaken about it but he is also a high priest L listen what hebrews goes on to say in another chapter chapter 7 verse 23 it says now there have been many of these those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office but because jesus lives forever he has a permanent priesthood Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifice day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins one for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints his high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law, appointed the son who's been made perfect forever. So the Bible is really, really clear that not only is Jesus, the, the baby that was born, not only is he a priest, he's, he's the high priest, and not just temporarily, but forever. And so let me ask the question maybe you're asking, so what? What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with us? And I don't ask that question, so what, like flippantly or facetiously or sarcastically. I hope in your learning to study the Bible, you will ask the question, so what? You don't want to start with that question. Probably a bad place to start. You better get there, though. Because if we just gather in settings like this or smaller settings and, and families and groups of men and women when they're studying the Bible, but we never ask the so what, man, we are missing out on what the Bible was wanting to do in us. Because if, like right now, if we just gather, we're like, Jesus was a priest. What are we having for lunch? <laughs> Let's go ahead and go. Like nothing's accomplished. So we've got to understand the, the, the so what. So what does it matter that he's talked about as being a priest? So let's, let's do that. What does it mean for us and what does it mean in general? It means this. We have access to God. As a priest, not only does Jesus have access to God, because he is in fact God, we believe that here by the way, that Jesus is God, but it also means then, then we are given this access to God. And I can, I can promise you that not a single person in this room, starting with me, understands the implications of what I just said, because if we did when I said it, it would have taken the breath out of our lungs. So let me say it again, that Jesus allows us, us, to have access to God the Father. I mean, that's, that's just hard to, that's hard to wrap our heads and hearts around. Earlier I talked about that only one person, the high priest, had access to the, the presence of God. And even he, even he could only go in, into that holy of holies, behind that veil, behind that curtain in the tent, one time a year. And when he went in there, as I've told you before, he would wrap a, you know, tie a rope around his ankles so that when he was in there, if something bad would happen, like he, like, passed out or, like, died or fell asleep, they could just drag his body out. They're like, we're not, we're not coming in there after you. <laughs> like, you don't go into the presence of God uninvited. So you're gonna need to take this rope in there with you so we can drag your, drag your poor corpse out if something happens to you. They did not go in the presence of God. But when Jesus, the high priest, came, he made, he made everyone available, everyone have access to the presence of God. He tore the veil from top to bottom, saying everyone is invited in, not just figurative language, that's actually literal language, Matthew 27, tells us that the moment Jesus died on the cross, the moment he breathed his last breath on the cross, literally right there in Jerusalem, in, in the temple, the veil tore from top to bottom, welcoming every single person into the presence of God. And that was because of what Jesus did. Now, a lot of us, we're so used to the idea 
that we get to be in the presence of God, that it just, it just loses something. We don't understand the weight of that truth. But, but listen, very few people in human history, very few people in human history have ever had the, the, the privilege and the opportunity that we, we have. And with great privilege comes great responsibility. You can read in the Old Testament, it's, it's pretty fascinating to read, all the preparations these priests would make before they dared enter into the presence of God. It was cleansings, and it was rituals, and it was meals, and it was fasting, and, and all these ceremonies to prepare to go in the presence of God. And, and they were just going in there briefly. But our privilege is so much more. Because we don't go in and out of the presence of God. We just always get to be in the very presence of God. Because as we know, and praise God for this, the presence of God, he it doesn't live in this building he doesn't live in, in a, a veiled room. He doesn't live in any place. He lives amongst people, not just near us and not just with us, but actually in us. The Bible tells us that, that when you say yes to Jesus, that the very presence of God, the very Holy Spirit of God, shows up and begins to dwell in you. He's done that for our sis right now. That God shows up. That God moves in, that you're forever in the presence of God. And, and it's an incredible privilege. And again, with incredible privilege comes this great responsibility. And so another question we have to ask is, in light of the idea that we're always in the presence of God, and the presence of God is always in us, how then should we live? In a word, worship. If, if you only occasionally enter into the presence of God, then worship is an act. But if you're always living in the presence of God, then, 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 then worship is a lifestyle. And so what does it mean to live a life of worship? And honestly, I know some of you be like, I don't know what that means. Does, does that mean I, I really have to spend all day, every day, humming or singing my favorite worship song all the time? Yes. No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, there'd be some like really bad times to sing your favorite worship song. If you're in a job interview and they're like, so tell us about yourself and you just burst out in a song, hey, that may glorify God. You're not getting the job and you probably need the job, okay? So like, don't do that. that that's not what it means to, to, to live a lifestyle of worship. What does it mean? It means that, that we're very, very intentional to ensure that we're honoring the one true God with every single area of our lives. And I mean every single area. And so some examples of this. This means, you know, think thoughts that honor God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, a guy named Paul said, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Paul knew this. Some of us need to get this, that the thoughts we think shape the life that we live. What we think about is who we become. And so be careful, because if you're like me, like I wouldn't want you to know all the private dialogue I have in my mind all the time, and like, you know, the memories I'm working through and the dreams I'm having, like it's not pretty all the time. We've always got these thoughts just like racing through our mind. Be careful to intentionally think about things as if it's a moment of worship between you and God. To so think about things that would honor God and also be very, very good with you. And then this speak words that honor God. We say in our family all the time, our family has a lot of words, a lot of words. My wife is like, yes, we do. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of words in our family. And, and, and we always say, I always say to my kids, make your words matter. Don't just count your words, but make your words count. Speak words of loving truth. Speak, speak goodness and kindness over people. Speak words that are going to intentionally build people up, not tear them down when they're not around. Speak good about them. You're talking about God's kids, by the way. And so be careful with the words that you speak. May the, the Bible says, may the words of my mouth and meditations in my heart be pleasing to you, O God. That What if every single word that came out of our mouth and out of our heart, we're like, man, that honors God and that honors God. I'm telling you, man, something good would be going on in your life. Think about this. Use your resources to honor God. Yeah, your resources. Remember, every area of life. And, and so give generously to, to, to work and to ministries that are, that are pointing people to God. Be intentional about giving resources to, to people that are forgotten and lonely and broken and they feel invisible. I would tell you absolutely to, if you're you know, part of this church, contribute to this church. This church honors God. The sole purpose of everything we're doing in this place is to help people find Jesus and follow Jesus. You want to honor God with resources, this is a good opportunity to do that. Use your talents to honor God. And don't you dare sit out there and be like, well, I don't have any talents. 
Yes, you do, Eeyore. you got talents. We all got talents. And whatever that you, 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 know, you have, use them for God. Like maybe you're a skilled musician or maybe you're a talented writer or maybe you're like really good building with your hands or maybe you're an eloquent communicator. Like whatever your God-given or developed talent may be, be intentional to use it in a way that honors the one true God. We are so privileged to be able to spend our entire existence in the very presence of God. Let's not be flippant about it. We can be comfortable in the presence of God, and we can be confident in the presence of God, just like I would want my own children to be comfortable and confident when they come and, and jump into my arms and talk about whatever, but we also want to be reminded of who he is. And when you're reminded of who he is, it, it kind of propels you to worship, not just some of the time, but all the time, and not just in here, but maybe even more so out there. And so because he's the priest, it means we have access to God. If that was it, that would be enough. But also this, it means that we have a role to play. As we talked about earlier, um, even a lot of Christ followers would not be inclined to think about Jesus as priest. Like if we were to come up with like labels or titles or names for Jesus, like priests would be like really, really down low the list for a whole lot of us at least. And like, man, Jesus is priest. That's kind of surprising. But, but there's another person that the Bible talks about as being a priest that would probably even surprise you more. You. And you. And you. And you. You're like, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> like in, the, in the Bible, priest, it's not like a, a title or a label or an office you get elected into. It's not like a role reserved for the spiritual elite because there is no such thing, by the way. I hope you already know that. A uh, priest was designed for everybody that had said yes to Jesus in their life, to be their king and be their high priest. Listen, 1 Peter chapter 2 says this, but you, speaking to those of you that have said yes to Jesus, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If you've been following Jesus, um, whether that's been like 40 days or 40 years or 40 minutes, like if you're following Jesus, the Bible talks about you as being a part of the royal priesthood. Put that on your resume and see how far it takes you. I'm a royal priest. They'd be like, yeah, anyway, where have you worked the last three years? But I'm just telling you, the Bible says that you're part of the royal priesthood. And it's like, okay, I'm a royal priest. Like, what are my roles and responsibilities of that? Well, there's roles and responsibilities, but I can, in a very thorough and clear way, say, here's your responsibility as part of the royal priesthood of God. It says, point people to the high priest. That's it. That's what we need to do. We're priests. But we cannot, nor can anyone else, do what only Jesus can do. I can't welcome people in the presence of God. Neither can you. But he can. I can't forgive anyone's sin. Neither can anyone else. But, but he can. I can't give out the gift of eternal life. But, but he can. And so as priests, we point people to the one who can do what we cannot do. And I will tell you this. We need to say this. That oftentimes in the church, not just this church, but like the church. There's only one church in the world. God's church is that there's sort of a tendency or temptation to believe, well, this priest business you're talking like, that, that's for the pastors to do. That's for the clergy to do. That's for the, the, you know, the people that got into Bible college to do. That, that's for, yes, I try to spend my life pointing people to Jesus. And all of us should because we're all part of the royal priesthood. Get this. We're a bunch of priests. It's funny to think about. We're a bunch of priests that are disguised as teachers and nurses and construction workers and, and pastors and retail managers and, and, and lawyers and doctors and first responders, policemen and women. And it's like we're, we're, we're actually priests just in disguise. And I, I would tell you that no, no matter what you do for a living, what, whatever it may be, you may be a stay-at-home parent, whatever it is, it's very, very significant. But your primary responsibility is to be doing anything and everything you can to help people see and know and love the high priest who can do what we cannot do and no one else can do. See, ultimately it's this, that because Jesus is our high priest, our sin has been dealt with once and for all. Isn't that an incredible truth? Like as Christ followers, our sin has been dealt with for good. Psalms 32 2 says, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. If you've said yes to Jesus, He's not holding your sin against you. He's also not holding it over you. It's not a ball and chain that you have to drag through life. Hear me now. It's gone. It's gone. Like the Bible says in a beautiful place that, that he takes your sin and, and separates it from you as far as the east is from the west. Like, well, how far is that? 
just really far. That's all I know. Like he has separated your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. Now, we don't always live like it, do we? We wallow in guilt. And we let shame and regret weigh us down. Do you know what we do sometimes is we live and we walk and we act as if our sin has not been dealt with. But it has. No other sacrifice needs to be made. No other blood needs to be shed. Nothing else needs to be done. The penalty has been paid. When Jesus died on the cross intentionally, not accidentally, he did what no uh, priest before him could ever do, and he did what no priest after him could have ever done. He dealt with sin once and for all done. That is why he said on that cross, confidently, triumphantly, victoriously, he said, it is finished. And the it he meant is that the sin of the people that I so deeply and completely love is done. Before Jesus, though, priest, year after year after year after year, would sacrifice lamb after lamb and goat after goat after goat, and year after year and decade after decade, they would gather around his people and they would, they would they'd place their hands, they would confess the sin, and they'd, they'd put the sin on the goat, and the poor old little goat would like run away. He didn't even know what was going on. He was just like, I'm out. And he would run off into the wilderness. And they did that year after year after year with the scapegoat, and year after year and decade after decade, what they were doing is Sin was remaining undealt with. And then the ultimate priest came, the real scapegoat came. And, and think about this, here's what happened. Is, is all of sin, of all humanity, past, present, future, was placed on the lamb. And then he took a walk outside the city of Jerusalem. L listen to what, the way it describes it in Hebrews chapter 13. It says the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. If you are someone that follows Jesus, your sin, all of it, the sin you're so ashamed of, the sin you still hope no one ever finds out about, the sin that has caused unbelievably complex and heavy circumstances and consequences in your life, the sin that you're even kind of lighthearted about, you don't think it was that big of a deal, it, it is all gone. You don't have to talk your way out of it. You don't have to try to make up for it. You don't have to try to tell a big story about it anymore. It's just gone. And, and, and here's, I said all that because I want to say this. There, there's, there's a lot of you here today, I'm sure. But just for whatever reason, you've never said yes to Jesus. And, and so... You, you probably feel that you're carrying the unbelievably heavy weight you were not designed to carry of shame and guilt and regret. Man, it is weighing you down. It is holding you back. It is keeping you up at night because you've let it define who you are. And Jesus, the one who came at Christmas, the high priest, would love nothing more for you this Christmas than to apply the sacrifice he already made. He doesn't need to make another sacrifice. The sacrifice he already made, he would love to apply that to you and say you're clean. It's all done. And, and you, don't, you don't have to talk him into it because he's just waiting. <laughs> you don't have to try to convince him you deserve it because you don't. That's the good news of the gospel. It's once you realize you don't deserve it that you're finally ready for it. You also don't have to make any promises of perfection moving forward. He'd be like, oh, that's cute. But anyways, come on, that's not going to happen. Like, you don't have to do any of that. All you have to do is, listen, all you have to do is let the only one who could ever forgive you, forgive you. And when you're ready to make that oh-so-significant oh so leap, plunge into the grace of God, man, just let us know that. Talk to a friend, talk to a volunteer here, talk to a paid staff. We would encourage you, if that's you, like you're ready now, like we'd encourage you to, you know, take out one of those connect cards and write your name on it and check the box that says baptism and, and like say, man, we're ready and we'll contact you ASAP and we'll literally set up the time that you can literally and figuratively take a plunge into the grace of God knowing that all the sin is forgiven. And, and when you take that step, whenever you're ready to take that step, what happens when you, when you say yes to Jesus is that um, you, you get access to God you get this incredibly significant role to play the rest of your life where you get to spend your life pointing people to the high priest, the one who set you and saved you free, and all of sin, all of it, is just gone. So you just let us know when, when you're ready to say yes. If you've been here before, you know that every single time we gather, every single time we gather, no matter what else we do, we do this. We, we celebrate the grace and the goodness of God. We celebrate that, that we have a high priest 
Jesus, who made a sacrifice once and for all, that we believe it was sufficient because he's sufficient, to cover our sin, pay for our sin, cleanse our sin. And so we have this meal called communion. It's in the seats out there. It's a little, tiny little piece of bread and a little juice. And so we're going to take that now as we just celebrate the high priest Jesus. And this bread that we eat together, it it represents his body that was willingly broken on the cross for us as part of the sacrifice. Then we have the juice. And it represents what the Bible says is so significant is is blood. I mean, I know the idea of blood is really uncomfortable and kind of weird and strange, but but in the in the Bible, because the way God planned it all out, blood was required to pay for sin. And so it was the blood of the ultimate Lamb Jesus that paid for the penalty of all of our sins, starting with me. And so let's drink this juice as a celebration of what He did. And then we pray for us, and we'll worship our High Priest. Jesus, just we, we say thank you a million times over for coming from heaven to earth. You knew before time even began that we were going to turn against you, that we were going to choose our own way, that we were going to try to improve upon your perfect plan, which of course was impossible to do. And you knew that the decision we made and we still make was going to be a very, very costly one. It was not one that you'd be able to pay, pay with gold, though you'd get a gift of gold when you were a baby. You knew there was nothing you were going to be able to give, nothing you were going to be able to send, nothing you were going to be able to transfer over to us, except it was just going to have to be you. And you came and lived a remarkable life here on earth, not for very long, because you came on a mission to live a a beautiful life, to die a gruesome death, and then to return back to life so that sin can be paid for once and for all. And Lord, we know that is the good, good news of the Bible, it is what this church is all about. It is the very story of Christmas itself. It is a gory, messy story, but it is so beautiful and life-changing. And Lord, especially for those who have never allowed you to be king of their life, leader of their life, high priest in their life, I pray that they would be inclined and compelled to do so very, very soon, knowing that there's no strings attached, there's just love and grace awaiting them. And we pray this in the name of our high priest, Jesus. Amen.